4.3 billion people live across this vast continent called Asia. And we are telling their stories. Out for blood. We go inside the dangerous underworld of gangs in Karachi and bring rich and poor together as the deadline approaches for a common economic system in Asia, will it actually happen? I'm Daniel Khan and this is Assignment Asia. Welcome to the program. Karachi is the most heavily populated city in Pakistan and one of the most dangerous. Parts of it are overrun by rival gangs whose deadly rampages make the headlines here all too often. Inside the city, there is one place that is particularly dangerous, and it's proving to be a real challenge for authorities. I managed to get a safe passage inside this criminal underworld to meet a man whose primary job is killing his rivals. We are going into a no-go zone. Police say pockets of this township are so dangerous they won't enter. The alleyways are controlled by gangs. They have sophisticated weapons, pistols, machine guns, and even rocket launchers. The people here live in constant fear. Every day, they pray to just make it through alive. This is Lyari Township in Karachi, the biggest city in Pakistan neighborhoods rampant with crime, where residents leave their homes only when they absolutely have to. Because outside, it's a battlefield. Our countless efforts have led us to meet one of the gangs, and now we are on our way to Leari, one of the most dangerous districts in the city of Karachi but they've only agreed to speak to us on the condition of anonymity. I meet an intermediary who's agreed to set up a meeting with a gang currently operating in the district. He has asked me to wait uh, for five minutes so that uh, they can check uh, the security situation here. When he comes back, we follow him to the gang's hideout. a building that's currently under construction. Gangs in Liari are constantly on the move, the intermediary tells us. For their own safety, they never stay in one place for too long. Inside, we meet Sajad, the gang's leader. He's just 23 years old and his story is tragic. Why did you create your own gang? MBBS ka student tha. Bahut acha student apni class mein top kya karta tha. I was a medical student. I finished at the top of my class. My parents were very proud of me. I belong to a middle class family. My parents wanted me to become a doctor and help people in my country. One day they went out to buy grocery and there were a clash between two political parties. In the exchange of gunshots my father got hit with four bullets, my mother with two. They were innocent. They had not done anything, yet they got killed. Losing his parents filled Sajad with rage and hardened his spirit. Not a day would go by when I would not think of avenging their death. One day a representative of the opposition party came to me and told me I was just wasting my time sitting around waiting for revenge. He asked me to take action. That was it. I did it and I killed. I have been killing ever since. Sajad and his gang members now work as hitmen, hired by warring political factions 
and other individuals and parties to take out their enemies. For him, killing has become a business. I get about $50 for every person I kill. I have killed about 50 people. I plan to hit 100. According to police, the number of people who die from gun violence every day in Karachi is more than those killed in terrorist attacks nationwide. Most are assassinated, deliberately stalked by gangs like Sajads and killed for a price. The government says more than 2,000 people fall victim to targeted killings every year. Others, like Sajad's parents, are caught in the crossfire between warring gangs split along political and ethnic lines and battling for territory. Liari is Karachi's smallest township but also the most densely populated. A result of decades of unregulated migration and settlement patterns that have caused a serious societal breakdown. More than two million people live in Liari, in neighborhoods largely segregated by their ethnic groups. The gangs extort money from residents and shop owners in exchange for protection. But nobody feels safe. Every day, Javed Odo goes to work knowing he could die. He's a deputy inspector general with the Karachi police, tasked by the government to clean up areas like Liari and purge them of criminals. Near and dear ones, I think. Uh, they are more worried uh, when it comes to that uh, because of the text messages that we used to receive, we, we are receiving from them. Uh, these days, mostly, uh, they end up with uh, may Allah protect you and keep you in safety. The government launched the crackdown in September 2013, and police are claiming success. So far, they say nearly 10,000 suspects have been arrested and tons of weapons and explosive materials seized. But Jawed says there are difficulties. The city's police force is 2,000 men short of full strength, and a lack of fuel and weapons makes their mission that much dangerous. How many police uh, officials and jawans have been martyred in uh, this uh, Karachi violence, and how do you maintain the morale of uh, the police force? Yes, this is one uh, sad aspect of uh, policing in Karachi, and obviously, uh, this has uh, uh, traditionally the number has been higher in this part of Pakistan than in many other areas. Uh, but the number is on decline, definitely. Uh, but even then, uh, it's not uh, to the level that we would very much like. Uh, for instance, in the last three months, uh, more than 19 of our uh, officers and uh, jawans, uh, they got martyred. Uh, so uh, it's a substantial number. The 19th, and if you look at the total number for the year, starting from this year, uh, the number comes around uh, more than 80. So it's a, a substantial number. So the, uh, because of this targeted action, obviously we are getting a reaction. And uh, but I'm sure uh, with the efforts we are making, this number is definitely going to go down. Jawed and his fellow policemen and rangers have been able to quell the violence in some townships. But the gangs, he admits, are the biggest challenge. We asked gang leader Sajjad if he could ever give up his lifestyle, but he says he sees no other way. Do you miss your old life? Do you ever wish to go back? I don't let myself think about my old life. There is no point in remembering the past. I can't go back there. All doors have been closed. The only way out for me is either jail or a bullet. Even after all this time, Sajjad is still angry. A son who grieves for his parents and is set on revenge.
क्योंकि जिस तरह मेरे वाले उन लोगों ने मुझसे छीने थे मैं उन सब के वाले छीन लूंगा द वे माई पेरेंट्स वो टेक अवे फ्रॉम मी आई विल टेक अवे देर पेरेंट्स आई वॉन्ट लेट दम फील पेरेंट्स कम्पैशन एज आई हैव टू लर्न टू लिव विदाउट इट आई लव माई पेरेंट्स एंड दे लव मी I crave their love every single day. जिस जिसने मेरे वालदेन की तरफ बंदूक उठाई या गोली चलाई मैं रोज अपने माँ-बाप के लिए दुआ करता हूं I'll keep killing till they are as miserable as I am. उनको तो कोई कसूर नहीं I pray for my parents every day. They work hard all their lives to support me, feed me and educate me. They wanted me to help people, help my country. I guess fate had other plans. I am not a doctor. I am a killer. पर नसीब में ये दिखा था कि मैं लोगों का खून बहाऊं। डॉक्टर तो बनना था मुझे, पर मैं अब कातिल स्पेशलिस्ट बन गया। Police one day might arrest or even kill Sajad, but it doesn't solve the bigger problem. There are so many others just like him, young men who lost loved ones to terror and whose grief turned them into killers breaking that cycle is ultimately how authorities might be able to bring order in these long lawless streets gang violence is generally seen as an act of terrorism here in pakistan and it's been reported that there are so many criminal cases pending at the moment the anti terrorism courts can't keep up it's a real dilemma for the court system as it tries to hold the criminals accountable still to come on assignment asia the deadline is approaching for a new economic system in asia but will it happen in time China's decision makers and thought leaders. See them in action. Hear their views. Debate their policies. Meet China's leaders with me. I'm Robert Lawrence Kim. There's a plan in place for all 10 ASEAN countries to come together to create a more competitive economic community but with the deadline rapidly approaching there are doubts it will happen in time with such a wide range of economic outlooks how will an advanced country like Singapore be able to work with a developing country like Laos Tony Chang traveled to both places to see what the challenges are and if the 10 Asian countries really can come together On the last day of this year a new economic giant will be born the ASEAN Economic Community a block of 10 nations representing more than 600 million people some of the richest but also poorest countries in the world 
How will that actually work? In Singapore, the gold standard. A society based on meritocracy, corruption-free, dynamic and efficient, the most successful of the Asian tiger economies. With a population of just over 5 million, the people here have an average annual income of more than $61,000 a year. And they estimate by 2030, this will be the richest country in the world. And that's very different to here, the Democratic People's Republic of Laos, where annual incomes are just $1,600 a year. And a third of the population survives on little more than a dollar a day. Balancing these two extremes seems almost impossible. The first thing to do, according to Professor Simon Tay, one of the Singaporean representatives at ASEAN, is to avoid the obvious comparison with the European Union. Our formula is different. We're not trying to really be a union, at the most, a community. And for a region sandwiched between two giants, a rising China and a rising India, unity is the only way forward. Learning to work together, is perhaps the best way in a tense Asia, in an underdeveloped Asia, to make our collective, us collectively matter more than if we were apart. So the old saying, I think, still goes. If we don't hang together, we'll hang separately. The devil, however, will be in the detail. This agro-business in Laos is trying a bold new venture that it hopes to take to new markets in ASEAN. Juice from sweet corn. The raw product is in plentiful supply. Agriculture still dominates here. But the processing and technology are all new. AEC standards will require hygiene and sanitation rules to be met, bottles pasteurized, and packaging standardized. We will enter the AEC in 2015, which will offer great benefit for this project, with better logistic transportation, service, import-export business, etc. But with the AEC, we have problems too. We have to come up with many new ideas to compete with goods in other ASEAN countries. The AEC will put Mr. Lumkam in direct competition with some of the largest agro-businesses in the world. But he thinks that size is on his side. And in a developing AEC market, he can adapt faster. In Singapore, it's all about aquaculture, not agriculture. Chien Hu is a Singaporean success story, a pig farm transformed to raise ornamental fish. Now the farmer's son, Kenny, is CEO of one of the largest tropical fish exporters in the world. But ASEAN is home to 60% of the world's ornamental fish exporters. Will Kenny go from being a big fish in a small pond to swimming in shark-infested waters? You know, Singapore businessmen and Singapore uh, 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 people, we live with competition. Precisely because of competition, Singapore is so successful. We have no natural resources, we have uh, nothing. But we are able to become the biggest exporters of ornamental fish purely because we know that the competition is uh, uh, coming from Thailand, from Indonesia, from Malaysia, and uh, they have the resources. Competition is one thing, but many companies still don't know the rules of the game. Standards and quotas that are supposed to be universal haven't yet been revealed. One of the big problems for a company like Chen Hu is they just don't know how far those barriers are going to come down by 2015. Time is running out. Suddenly, you have a 600 million uh, you know, market uh, for you to explore. So it's up to individuals how they can capture the market shares rather than worrying about level playing field. As the sun sets on the Mekong, it doesn't seem like this sleepy corner of Southeast Asia is ready for the change that comes at the end of the year. But Laos is trying to shake off its sleepy image and become far more dynamic economically. And when the AEC comes into being in late 2015, Laos will be part of an economic bloc that contains some 600 million people. And if all of that goes according to plan, this will be part of the sixth largest economy in the world. And there are concerns that the unique cultural tapestry 
of this region could be sacrificed for economic growth. With the erosion of borders and a greater movement of workers, will countries like Laos lose their charm? Laurent Grenier hopes not. He owns a boutique travel agency providing individually tailored tours of Laos to tourists from Europe. We walked around one of Vientiane's bustling markets, and Laurent explained why he'd like to see visa restrictions lifted once the AEC comes into effect. We've, we've got here some handicrafts from Laos. Yes. Uh, you know, people here are a little bit concerned that they could be swamped when they become part of the ASEAN economic community. Do you think that'll happen? I do not think so. Uh, each uh, country has its own uh, characteristics, its own features, its own identity. So no matter if you get along together to bring more uh, guests from uh, outside or within the ASEAN community, I don't think it will alter the, the, the identity of each destination. And for your business, tourism, what would be the most important thing that changes in 2015? If we have a single visa scheme for Southeast Asia, that will be a big improvement, I would say. I mean, at the moment, they haven't really given too many details about that. They've said that 2015 is a starting point. Would you like to see that a priority? Absolutely, yes. I think uh, if we refer to uh, what I know from Europe with the Schengen visa scheme, if something uh, appear, uh, happens along these lines, I would think it would be beneficial for all destinations. There are some dark clouds on the horizon, however. The launch date, already pushed back 12 months, still looks like a major challenge as standardized regulations and practices remain unresolved. And a global economic slowdown, combined with slower Chinese growth and poor export numbers, is leading some governments to be more cautious than in the past. But perhaps the greatest challenge is basic understanding of how the AEC will work. Not amongst bureaucrats and politicians, but with the buyers and sellers who will immediately feel the impact of falling barriers and tariffs. In one of Singapore's largest retail markets, where fresh produce is imported from all over ASEAN, the traders had no idea what impact the AEC would have. At this stage, there is still time to turn things around. And even if the timetable slips, ASEAN seems to be heading in the right direction. We are on track. We haven't been derailed. But the train, like a lot of trains in Asia, is going more slowly than we had anticipated. And there will be uh, you know, bumps on the road. Uh, hopefully, we'll manage them. But I, I actually am one of those people who says, better to go slowly with all 10 countries on board, rather than to go too fast and have a derailment. ASEAN is a region of vivid contrasts. From the quiet solitude of a spiritual retreat on the banks of the Mekong in Laos, to the bustle and commerce of the region's commercial and financial hub in Singapore. It should come as no surprise that the ASEAN economic community will have a prolonged and complicated union. The real test will be whether all 10 nations can work together in the longer term. For Assignment Asia, I'm Tony Cheng. ASEAN is the European Union's third largest trading partner, so the EU is closely monitoring these developments. However, according to a report by the European Parliament, the 2015 deadline doesn't seem likely, mainly because it will take some time to fully integrate all of the economies. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Don't forget, you can watch all of our episodes on our website, www.assignment-asia.com. You can also share your thoughts and contribute story ideas for future shows by contacting us on social media. I'm Daniel Khan. Thanks for watching and join us again on Assignment Asia.
我叫李李，出生在中国北京。我是一个画者，在小的时候画画的时候，发现一个问题，就是我临的很多这个历代名家的大作的时候，有很多的物种现在都已经没有在咱们国家上出现了，就是我画画的对象。可能以后也会不不在了，所以我就萌生了这个想法，不想让我绘画的这个对象消失，就开始十八岁建立了黑豹影楼保护站。北京这个物种算是排在全球的前列，还有成群成群的野猪，还有成群成群的斑羚。他真的是在与心和心的在沟通，就是他会习惯我们的存在，我们会习惯他，他会接能够接纳我们，就是我会慢慢的来静下来，来让他来读懂我。我们在这儿住了十四年，那么老乡和我们之间的关系就像亲人一样，很密切，很很友好。那么在巡护的两趟的时候，会有一些老乡老乡会主动来。拦下你的车，跟你讲一些事情，比如说有一些盗猎的事情，或者有一些需要救助的事情。在我的人生中，就是想把最年轻的这段岁月，来回报给这个自然，回报给大山，回报给这些野生动物。